I have an announcement to make. You don't have to think the worst. You don't have to mentally rehearse failure. Actually, God's Word instructs us to only think about things which are true, honest, and just. We're told to focus on the good report. Your mind cannot be allowed to go in the wrong direction. You have to govern your mind with what the Lord says. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Builders today. My name is Michelle Steele, and it is my privilege to have this opportunity to share God's Word with you, to build your faith, and to help you understand that your mind is your mind. Your mind is the mind of the Lord. You do not have to allow wrong thoughts to drag you down wrong paths. Today, we're going to talk about governing our mind with the Word of God and having the Word of God as a guidance system of what we're allowed to think. And then if it doesn't fall within that system, we're not thinking it. Let's go together to the book of Isaiah chapter 26. And I want to start in chapter 26 with verse three. The Bible says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I first of all want to just take a moment for us to get a definition of the word peace that coincides with the definition God has of this word. He says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Why do we want that? Why, why is that so important to us? Well, of course, anybody would say, oh, yeah, I want peace. Yeah, I want some peace. I want to have peace in my life. But if you knew what God thinks about this word, his definition of the word peace is a lot different than the definition we use in our society today. The word peace is the word shalom in the Old Testament, and it means the peace that comes from being made complete, the peace that comes from being made whole, the peace that comes from a condition of your life where you have nothing missing and nothing broken. Now stop right there and just imagine your life complete. There is absolutely nothing missing from your life. There's not supply missing. There's not money missing. There's not health missing. You have all the health you need. You have all the financial supply that you need. You have all of the peace that you need, all of the joy that you need, all of the... You, this is the condition of life that this word is talking about. He will keep you in Peace, perfect peace, peace, peace. It's a, this word perfect also means peace. And so he's compounding these two together to say, God will keep your life in a condition that is so complete and so whole that you have nothing missing, nothing broken as you keep your mind stayed on him. So the key to the flow of this condition of peace, this flow of restorative peace. Now, listen, if you're sitting there right now and you're saying, wait, Michelle, wait, wait, <laughs> I'm not even at anywhere near this condition of life. I'm not anywhere near having my life, nothing missing, nothing broken. Don't get under condemnation. Just hang on. Let the peace of God flow into your life because the peace makes you whole. The peace causes you to be complete. The peace will come in and restore those things that are missing and broken. Now, you've heard my testimony. If you haven't, let me tell you real quick. I ran away from home as a teenage girl at 15 years old. I ended up on the streets of Nashville, Tennessee. I was selling my body. I was putting needles in my arms. I was a drug addict for nearly eight years. I had children during that time and lost custody of my children. I had uh, my, the man who was my pimp married me and he died of a drug overdose the day after he was sentenced to the armed robberies we were involved in. I almost went to prison for 10 years for three counts of attempted armed robbery. Go ahead and put your seatbelt on because we're just going to be real today, okay? And so when I, when Jesus Christ came walking in my graveyard and found me in the messed up, miserable condition that he found me in, there was nothing but missing places and broken places and destroyed things from all of the bad decisions 
I had made. I made those bad decisions. I ruined my life. Yes, sin was, was destroying me. Yes, that addiction was destroying me. But when I came to him, Jesus Christ saved me and his peace began flowing in my life and he began restoring me. He first of all restored my sanity. He restored me into my right mind so that I could make right decisions and choose to come to church and choose to read my Bible and choose to trust in him. He restored my custody of my children. He brought into my life Philip Steele, who is the man who's loved me like I'm sugar candy. He loves me better than, than anybody's ever loved me before. He's restored. God has restored my life. His peace has been constantly flowing into my life since the day I received Jesus on August 10th of 1992. Jesus Christ has been restoring my life. His peace has brought me back to the level where I'm, I'm, I'm obtaining that place. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing broken. This is what I'm talking about. If you're not there yet, just let this peace flow. And to have this flow of restoration in your life, you're going to have to apply the truth I'm about to teach you because you can't, it won't flow in your life if your mind is all scattered. And if you're focused on the problem and you're focused on the evil report and you're focused, if you're worried and you're tore up from the floor up, you're not going to have the flow of peace operating in your life like you need to. So listen, Isaiah 26, 3 is what I'm reading. And this is a key. This is an answer for you. You should write that down. You should get your Bible right now. If you don't have your Bible with you, write it down. Go back on our podcast and, and listen to this again. You can find us on iTunes. You can watch us from my webpage. You can watch this broadcast again. It's got a link to the VTN webpage so that you can see this over and over because faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. You need to know that God wants to bring you to a place of restoration. God will keep you in perfect peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. When your mind is stayed, You've got to keep your mind stayed on the Lord. You've got to keep your mind stayed, fixed, focused, not allowing your mind to be focused on the world's problems. You can't fix all the world's problems, but God can. You've got to keep your mind stayed on him. This word mind in my center column reference, it tells me that this word mind means thoughts. You've got to keep your thoughts stayed on God. You've got to keep your thoughts stayed on his promise, his, his covenant with you through the blood of Jesus Christ. You've got to keep his thoughts, your thoughts stayed on him. It also means imaginations. You've got to keep your, you've got to be imagining what the Bible says is going to happen to you, not what the, the commercial says. You know, all, all you got to do is let the commercials play and you will have some bad imaginations because they take you through a scenario of symptoms to find out if you have this symptom and if you have that symptom and what are those causing. Those thoughts, those phrases are causing you to imagine what would it feel like to have that symptom? What would it feel like to have restless leg syndrome? What would it feel like to to have, wait, wait, I don't want my mind going down that way. I'm in the process of being restored. I'm in the process of my life coming back to the place of nothing missing, nothing broken. I've got to keep my mind stayed on the Lord. I love how the translation of God's word translation says about this phrase. It says that he will keep him in perfect peace. And this phrase, whose mind is stayed on the Lord, the God's word translation says, whose mind cannot be changed. God will keep you in the complete flow of restorative power when your mind cannot be changed off the Word of God. When you get your mind in that condition where it's thinking God's thoughts, it's thinking in line with what the Word said, and you say, I'm not changing my mind to fit my situation. I'm going to make my situation bow down to the truth of God's Word. I am not going to allow my circumstance to make me think God's Word isn't working. I'm not going to allow what I see, what I think, what I feel. I'm not going to allow what I'm going through to make me change what I believe about the Word of God. See, the tactic of the adversary is to blind the mind. That's how he works. That's his M.O. He uses blinding techniques against the mind to get, your, to get you to respond in the way he wants you to respond. He wants your attention. And, and, and I'm going to try not to jump ahead of myself, but think about Eve. Eve acted 
based on her, how her mind changed. The enemy changed her mind. And see, it, God will keep us in perfect peace whose mind cannot be changed, whose mind has stayed on him. I'm not changing my mind. The enemy came and he brought a different idea. He brought a different thought pattern to Eve and she accepted his thought pattern until she saw things differently. And I'm already ahead of myself. So I'm going to back up real quick and I'm going to go back to the, <laughs> the thought, the tactic the way the enemy operates against you is to try to blind your mind, trying to make you uh, blind to the truth of God's word. Okay, he wants to take your thoughts down a road of worry, fear, unforgiveness, you fill in the blank. What road is he trying to take you down? Is it worry that you're not going to be able to pay your bills? Well, if he can get you focused on that, he will get you highly developed in worry and you will become like a magnet drawing to you the thing you dread because faith is the substance of things you hope for and fear will, the opposite reciprocal truth to that is that dread becomes like a magnet for the things that you fear. Fear will bring to you the things that you are dreading. So if, if he's got your mind down that road of worry, down that road of fear, if he's got you focused on dreading, you dread going to the mailbox. You dread the, every time the phone rings. You dread, why? Because there's a bill collector. There's another bill coming and I don't have I got too much month at the end of my money. No, no, I can't let my thoughts go down that direction because that's not in line with what God said. God said, I have all sufficiency. Listen, I'm a giver. I'm a giver. I'm a tither. My, first of all, the devourer is rebuked for my sake. This is what you got to say. You got to talk. And if, first of all, you need to be a tither to be able to say this. <laughs> and you need to be a giver to be able to act. It. But listen, I'm a tither and I'm a giver because I think in line with the word. I know that tithing is my benefit. It's for my benefit. It, it blesses me. I'm a tither. I'm a giver. That I am not in a position of lack because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm always going over, never going under. I have all sufficiency in all things and I'm abounding to every good work. That's coming out of my mouth because that's what I, that's what I have governed my mind to think. I do not allow my mind to go down the, the road, the path of worry and fear. And that's what the enemy wants to do. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that he, that's how he operates. He blinds the minds of them who do not believe. I want to specifically read it rather than just quote it because um, there's a added benefit to hearing the word of God specifically. The Bible says in verse three, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them, which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine unto them. So notice in this verse that it says the enemy works through mind blinding, but it is, it is the, um, God works through bringing light into your situation. He says that he's trying to blind people from seeing the light. He's trying to blind you from seeing the light that's in the gospel. Well, the gospel isn't something we just acquaint ourselves with the day that we receive Jesus as Lord. I live in the gospel. The gospel's good news. <laughs> the gospel, I, I need the gospel every day. I use the gospel every day. It's the word of God. So you, you could say, it says that he, the enemy is blinding the minds of those who do not believe the light of the glorious good news that Jesus Christ, well, what's the good news if you're having financial struggle? Well, the good news is that he became poor, that we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake, he became poor so that we through his poverty might be made rich. Praise God. Praise God. That's good news. And that good news brings light to my situation that I don't have to submit to poverty. I don't have to put up with poverty. I don't have to compromise with poverty. I don't have to allow lack to trespass in my life. I've been redeemed from lack. So if lack comes into my life, I need to step up and say, excuse me, what do you think you're doing here? No, you're not. This is not. No, you don't belong here. You don't have a right to be here. This is God's property. And in Jesus name, lack needs to leave. I am. I'm escorting you out the front door. You are not coming back into my house in Jesus name. That's an attitude that is in line with the word of God. The enemy tries to blind your mind from that. And he'll make you think, 
you just, you just don't have enough and God just hadn't blessed you yet and for some reason you're just not getting the blessing and that word stuff isn't working and that, that confession stuff isn't working and why are you even going to church and why are you even putting your tithe in because it's not working. And if you will agree with that, then you'll act in line with it the same way Eve let the thoughts of the enemy change her behavior. Oh my goodness, I'm getting ahead of myself again. So I want us to look again at the fact that the enemy comes in with his mind-blinding technique, his, the reason that we need to keep our mind stayed on the Lord so that his peace, his restorative power can flow unhindered in our life is because that's the key that God has given us. The enemy, he attacks through getting your attention to focus on the dark things, to blind your mind, to block you from seeing the answers that God has for you, the provision that he's made for you, the benefit that you have as an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give an example of how someone who once saw things completely in the light went over because of thoughts because they accepted wrong thoughts, they went over into the place. I've already talked about Eve, so I'm not even going to try to go there again. Eve, I, I am going to go there again. I just can't help it. Have mercy. So Eve was in the light. She was walking in the light of God's word, and she was behaving herself in line with the word of God until wrong thoughts entered her thought life. And it said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, evidence is in that verse that her mind changed. We've already looked at the fact that the verse from Isaiah 26 in God's Word translation says that He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind cannot be changed. Her mind was changed. Why? Because she thought wrong thoughts and it changed her mind and it changed her behavior. And I want to give you this other example because this is so good. If you have your Bible, let's go together to the book of John chapter 1 and I want you to see... John the Baptist. Now remember John the Baptist? He was the forerunner. He was the one sent to proclaim that Jesus, he, he was baptizing people and saying, uh, repent and, and, and the kingdom of God is coming. And he was the forerunner declaring Jesus Christ. And so in John chapter 1, he says this, verse 32, John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him, speaking of Jesus. So John is saying, hey, hey, I saw personally, I saw the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus and abode upon him and I didn't recognize he was the one. It says, I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said to me, upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. So John received revelation knowledge from God. God the Father spoke to John and said, when you see the Spirit descending upon him and abiding upon him, he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, and he's the one I want you to baptize. And it said in verse 34, John said, I saw it and I bear record that this is the Son of God. This is the one. This is the Messiah. Do you see that in your Bible? John 1, 32, this is the Son of God. Okay. Now, in Luke 7, 19, something happened. In Luke 7, this is after John had been taken captive. He had been taken prisoner uh, by Herod. And in, in Luke chapter 7, in verse 19, John, calling unto two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you... He that should come, or do we look for another? What happened to him? He used to know. He was the one who had the revelation knowledge from God that the one you see the Spirit descending upon, he's the one. Something blinded John's mind. He used to walk in the light, and now something has blinded his mind. A thought pattern has taken him down a path, and he has ended up at a destination other than the destination God wanted for him. And I'm telling you, you have got to guard your mind. You've got to rule your mind with the Word of God. You've got to govern your thought patterns with God's Word because the enemy's trying to take you somewhere that God doesn't want you to go. 
And John said, are you the one or do we look for another? And Jesus responded and said, you go tell John that the lame people are walking, the blind people are receiving sight, the poor are having the gospel preached unto him. But verse 23 of Luke 7 is so important. And he said, blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. So we know that the destination John the Baptist ended up in was the destination of offense. God's word would have protected him from going there. If he had allowed God's word to govern his thinking, he wouldn't have been taken down that path into that destination, but he was blinded in his mind from something that he once saw through revelation knowledge. I think it's important. God's method is to reveal things to us through revelation knowledge. Our mind has to contain, has to remain in that position, uh, that condition that we can receive God's thoughts. You know, when Eve, when Eve allowed the enemy to his thoughts to come into her mind, it warped her thinking. It's like taking, it's like taking diesel and putting in a gas engine. It warps it. You can't, you got to throw it away. You got to replace the engine because you cannot use the engine anymore. It warps it. And that's why the Bible says that we need to let the word of God renew our mind. Romans 12, 2 says that, that the renewing of the mind, God said it this way in Joshua chapter one and verse eight, God said to, to Joshua that to meditate on the word of God, that he needed to keep this word in his mouth and in his heart day and night. I want to read it to you real quick before we close here. Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. Meditating in the word of God, this book of the law that he was telling Joshua, for us, it's the word of God. It's the promises of our new covenant. That was the instruction book. In other words, you could say this book of instruction. Well, we have a book of instruction. And if we'll meditate in it day and night, if we will let it govern the direction of our thoughts, we'll keep our mind stayed on him. And as we keep our mind stayed on him, we allow the restorative power of peace to continually flow in our life. I love how Psalm chapter one corroborates this truth. It says in Psalm chapter one, verses one through three, blessed is the man or the woman that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, the instruction, the word of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate night and day. You see, I got my mind focused on it. And the result is verse three, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bring forth fruit in your season. Your leaf shall not wither and whatever you do will prosper. So we see from Joshua 1, 8 and Psalm chapter one, verse three, that focusing on the word, letting the word govern my thought patterns causes my life to experience the blessing of God causes my, there's a physical manifestation of my focus. There's a, a manifestation of the blessing when we focus on God and we focus on Jesus Christ and what his word provides for us in the new birth. You know, all of this that we've talked about, the victory in the mind, the victory uh, that we have over over the curse that's in this world so that we can resist it and not allow it to come into our life. This victory is through Jesus Christ. He obtained the victory for us. He died on the cross in our place. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He is the redeemer. He is the one who purchased us out of the price that we owed for the sin in our life. And so everything is available when we receive Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you are submitting your life to the power of His peace. You are submitting your life for, so that He can do like He did for me and come in and restore your life. You know, I want to give you an opportunity today to say, Jesus, I want to make you the Lord of my life. This is the moment. That, that you've been waiting for. Right now, open your heart and say this with me. Father, I want Jesus to be my Lord. I submit my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross in my place. 
I believe his blood purchased my life. I believe God raised him from the dead. And today I receive him as my savior and my Lord. If you believed in your heart and you did, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible says you shall be saved. This moment you are made a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away and all things are created new. And you might be like I was, totally saved, but everything in my life was a, a, a result of the decisions and the, the sin life that I had lived before Christ. There's hope for you. There's promises for you. There's help for you in God's word. And if you will just allow this peace to restore your life, you can have the life worth living. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I want you to have the abundant God kind of life. I don't want you to be struggling every day. I don't want you to be under the, the pain of depression and the darkness of despair. I want you to be walking in the joy of the Lord. I want you to be walking in the fullness that His salvation will bring. And it's a day-by-day -day process of restoration. And the key is that you keep your mind stayed on Him. I encourage you. Get a local church. You need a pastor. Every believer needs a pastor. You need a pastor. Find a local church. Let God lead you to a church. And let the Word of God. Get a Bible and stay in it every day because the Bible tells you who you are. You won't even know who you are. You won't even know what you have until you let the Word of God show you because you're a new creature. You've never known you before. You've never known what you have. And, and now you need the Word of God. This is the... This is the owner's manual. This is the, the manual from the factory where God tells you that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're free from the dominion of sin. Praise God for his goodness. I'm so glad you tuned in today. I am so glad that you tuned in. And I want to remind you to build your faith and frame your world by the word of God. Partnership is God's method of distribution. Not only does the Lord use the covenant of partnership to publish the gospel of Jesus Christ, He distributes giftings, anointings, and revelations through the body as we share in this ministry. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul was writing to his partners, and he made this statement, You are all partakers of my grace. He didn't say God's grace. Paul said, My grace. In other words, Paul was saying, as my partners, you share in the grace God has supplied me to carry out my ministry. The Lord has graced or anointed this ministry to help free people from drugs, from alcohol. A woman named Susan wrote our ministry to say this. She said, I am sending a small gift and a thank you for your faithful work. I ordered your books for my family, and we are seeing answers to prayer for my niece, a 21-year-old recovering from heroin addiction. My mom and I use your intervention prayers, and your life gives us hope for my niece to have a future. Many people like Susan have partnered with this ministry. They have accessed that anointing to help their loved one find freedom. I want to say thank you to every brave person who is standing between the living and the dead. I'm honored to have you as my partner. Thank you for being a faith builder. Your support makes a difference. Call or go online today. Join Michelle as she helps people build faith and frame their world by the Word of God.